So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Jody De uh, Degner. <clears throat> she's a cast cadre member, and she's at the Bartholomew School District, which is, for those of you who don't know, one of the um, preeminent UDL institutions in the country. And so I'll just give you a little brief bio here. She is a um, facilitator of UDL, and in her role at BSC, she works... I'm sorry, I've got the shakes too much coffee this morning. Um, she works on different cultural design and deeper learning projects. So, without further ado, I'd like to bring up Jody. She's right over here. She's going to blow our minds with some UDL stuff. I will say that had I known Brian was going to look so excellent today, I would not have dressed conservatively. <laughs> Jody Degner. <laughs> You're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, what an absolute pleasure to be with you guys in Orlando and to be talking about culturally responsive teaching and the UDL connection. <clears throat> really exciting. So thanks for having me. So some of you may have heard the analogy that teaching is a little bit like building an airplane while you're flying it. And while I might not agree with, with that analogy of, of my experience today, I can safely say that within my first couple of years of teaching, that most certainly was an apt analogy. In fact, there were probably days that I was building the plane as it was kind of going down. <laughs> but I can also remember kind of getting to a place of comfort after about five years of teaching, feeling like I was getting around to being a content expert in literature and composition. Uh, I can remember planning becoming more efficient and kind of intuitive. Uh, feedback was becoming uh, more efficient for me. And I was always a relationship person, so I loved being with kids. And suddenly, I didn't really know so much about teaching and learning anymore. I had an awful lot to learn myself. But the great news for me was that I was in a great place for that to happen. And one of my earliest memories of being at BCSE is sitting across the post-conference observation table with my department chair who had recently evaluated uh, and observed my teaching. And we were having these really great deep conversations about UDL implementation and where I was and where I wanted to go and, and how I was going to get there and what she wanted to see and what I was able to do. And then we got to a line item on the evaluation that was titled Cultural Perspectives. And I can remember I had scored a three out of four in this line item. And just like I did with everything, I would say, okay, so I want to talk about this. Tell me how I go from a three to a four. And so we went from having this really great deep and wide conversation about UDL to having what felt like kind of a circular and, and kind of superficial conversation about culturally responsive teaching. And we were both really dedicated professionals who had a great working relationship together. And we were sitting there together, really kind of having a hard time coming up with what improvement in that area of my teaching should look like. And so we kind of left the conversation and said, let's go think about this some more and we'll come back together later. And when we came back together later, we both had come to the conclusion that the problem in our conversation um, was that we were defining culture in a pretty singular way. We were talking about culture in terms of race and ethnicity almost exclusively. And what we know is that there are many, many parts of culture that are not represented by a flag. And so even though, you know, I told you before, I was the relationship teacher, right? So I was really sensitive to my kids who moved around a lot, uh, to my kids who had families going through divorce, my kids who were living in poverty, uh, my kids who were living with mental illness. I was really sensitive to the way that that affected their learning. However, I was really sensitive to it on the back end. So he was responding to it uh, in a very reactive way, which created a lot of discord for me because Everything I was learning about UDL said we're supposed to be proactive about those things. And so as I continued to kind of learn more about UDL, I got really hungry for understanding culturally responsive teaching more. And so as I began to, to read and research and start making connections between culturally responsive teaching and universal design for learning, some really, really exciting things happened for me. So I looked to, to some people like uh, Geneva Gay at the University of Washington in Seattle. I also looked to um, Louise Moll, 
who um, is the, in the College of Education at the University of Arizona. And as I looked into their studies and, and listened to their talks and, and, and read through their stuff, some really exciting connections started happening for me. And the first thing was that I came to a really clear definition of what cultural responsiveness was. And it's a two-part definition. So the first part of this definition is that we, we must include cultural diversity in our content and curriculum, which is to say that we have to represent different heritages and perspectives in the content and curriculum that we teach. It's also the part of cultural responsiveness that tells us that it's really, really important for our students to see lots of different kinds of people in positions of knowledge and power and success. So that's cultural diversity, and it centers on our content. And the second part is cultural variability, which focuses on pedagogy, the way that we teach those histories and perspectives and all of that content and curriculum. And this part of cultural responsiveness demands that we must teach it in multiple ways. Let me just say that one more time. The cultural variability is the part of cultural responsiveness that demands that we must teach in multiple ways. And I hope that for those of you in the room, that the, the, the UDL alarm, alarms are kind of going off. And hopefully you're saying, Multiple ways, you mean like multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression. And yes, that is it. But there's also more, and I'll get to that. So as I, 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 uh, about four years ago, I transitioned from being a classroom teacher for BCSE to being a UDL facilitator, which is to say that I support teachers in their UDL environments now. And so as I was designing and delivering um, professional learning around UDL and cultural responsiveness, the number one question I always get, it's not why, we know why. It's not what, we have a sense of what. It was always how. How, Joni? How am I supposed to be an expert on all of the various cultures that are represented in my classroom? And they're always surprised to hear my answer, which is, you don't. You don't have to be an expert on every cultural nuance that your students bring into your classroom. However, you do have to be an expert on your own cultural identity. And you do have to be an expert on how that shapes your teaching habits. And so let me just put this out there. That everything we say and everything we do is defined and dictated by our own culture. So think about that in terms of teaching behaviors. Think about the things that you say and the things that you choose not to say to your kids. Think about the words that you use in your classroom, the stories and the anecdotes that you use to teach. Think about student behavior that you feel that you must attend to and that student behavior that you feel like you simply have to ignore because you're not comfortable addressing that. All of those decisions, all of those teaching habits, they are governed and, and seen through your own UDL lens. It's really important for us as educators to have a heightened awareness of our own cultural identity and how that shapes our teaching. That's step one. The other part is that we absolutely must give our students opportunities to understand and reveal who they are and what they value. And in doing so, we also start to find out where some of those values come from, which is really important for us. And then our job is that when they start revealing those things about themselves, we have to be good data collectors. We have to have our eyes and ears open so that we can grab that information and turn it in immediately to elements of design in our learning environments so that we can create learning environments where students see themselves and what they value reflected on a regular basis so that they understand that all voices matter when it comes to designing a learning environment. So as I started synthesizing some of these ideas, I got really excited about it. I started sharing more and more with my teachers. And I had read this online blog from a teacher who had started her school year by asking students a very simple question. What kind of teacher do you want? 
And in the secondary world, that's really not usually ex how the things go. Usually it's here's the syllabus, and here is the, the late work policy, and, um, and now it's kind of time to get going. What was your name again? Okay, yes, that's your name, and now we're going to get going. That's kind of the world of secondary education sometimes. So I had some teachers who were really excited about beginning their school year in a way that they had never done before. And so as they did this, um, they got some really great answers, like the ones that you see up here from their students. But they also got some really poignant and really important answers from their students. They had students who said the words patient, loving, supportive. They even got responses like laughs with us, not afraid to look silly in front of us. And I can remember walking by uh, her room, this teacher's room, at the, at the end of the, near the end of the school year last year. And I kind of leaned in her door, it was her prep period, and we're talking, and I, I saw that poster hanging on the wall, and I said, you know, I really love that you started your year that way with your kids. And she said, you know what, I left that up there because it's actually for me. On my toughest day of teaching, I can see that and always be reminded of what my kids actually need from me. Another one of my teachers took it a step further, and they did it not only with their kids, but they posed the same question to parents on open house night. What kind of teacher do you want for your kid? And you might not be able to see some of these responses, but it says enthusiastic, approachable, upbeat, and fun-loving. And my personal favorite, one with swagger. <laughs> right? And the truth is, these responses represent what these kids and these parents and these families find to be important in education and the people who are in charge of learning environments. And when we can help students see that their voices matter and that there is overlap between what's valued at home and what's valued at school, now we're really getting somewhere and we're really creating some powerful connections between students and education. So one of my other teachers, she always came to me, and we have a lot of fun designing together. She says, Joni, can you help me with this project? Can you help me with this rubric? And I love working with her. But we always get to a point at somewhere in our planning process where I say, I don't know. I think you should ask your students. And it kind of became a running joke. Like, she'll pop into my office, and she'll ask me something. And before I you know, respond, she'll say, let me guess. I should go ask my students. Uh, and the answer is a lot of times, yeah, you should. And so let me tell you what she did. She made ask your students a thing in her classroom. She is now regularly pulling a group of four or five students every week, different students every week, a pretty informal setting. Before class, right after class, in between classes, sometimes she asks them if they can pop in right before school. And she just asks them, hey, what's working for you and what's not working for you in class this week? And she's taking their feedback and implementing it almost immediately, that day. A really, really powerful exercise in voices being heard in the classroom. Some of the really great feedback that she's gotten from students, one of my favorites is, and she said she was having a tough week, and she knew she was having a tough week, and it wasn't even about school or kids. It was just about, you know, the work-life balance, the eternal struggle of the teacher. And one of her kids said, you're yelling at us a lot this week. And just as she was about to get kind of, like, offended about it, she looked at the other kids in the group, and they're, like, nodding, like, and she said, I knew I was having a tough week, but I didn't know I was interacting with my kids that way. But that awareness, that feedback from them saying, hey, you're interacting with us that way, and it feels really icky and threatening in the learning environment, so change it. And she did. And what a great thing for them to say, hey, we told her, and she, it's different now. One of the other pieces of feedback she got from her kids was that um, they needed more assistance and more support in project planning. He said, hey, you know what? You give us a lot of really great ideas and support at the beginning of our projects, but sometimes they start sort of sagging in the middle and we have trouble kind of getting to the great outcome. And so together they designed a project planning form for the class to use. And what a beautiful thing to say, we're having trouble with that. And she says, okay, help me design something. And then it's implemented. That's really, really powerful. And so to bring this back to the piece that brings all of us here, to bring this back to universal design for learning and to make this connection. The ultimate goal of universal design for learning is to grow expert learners. And when we support cultural variability through universal design for learning, that means that we begin by saying, if I want students who are purposeful and motivated, I must help them discover 
and also show them that I value what motivates them. If I want students who are resourceful and knowledgeable, it begins with me saying, I honor and value the resources and knowledge that you come to me with. And then if I want students who are strategic and goal-directed, that begins with me saying, I understand that your goals and your strategies might be a little bit different than mine, but I can find value in those and I can help you continue to grow and develop those. And I have to say this, that universal design for learning and cultural responsiveness are not the same thing. Implementing one does not make the other inherent, but they do need each other. By definition, culturally responsive teaching says that we must teach in multiple ways. And universal design for learning offers the proactive approach that that requires. And culturally responsive teaching has the power to make our UDL practices deeper and wider and more culturally inclusive. There's a statistic out there that a lot of studies seem to agree on that somewhere around 80% of teachers in the United States are white middle class folks which means that a lot of students in our country will grow up and go to school and never having a teacher that they can culturally identify with. And while we might not be able to immediately remedy the problem of diversity in the field of teaching, we can remedy the way that we design learning environments. And we can, we can design learning environments that students can culturally identify with. And if we can do that, we can create really powerful connections between students and education, between students and each other, and between students and us, which is really the name of the game, connection. And in a country where division is growing wider by the day, it is our responsibility to not only grow expert learners, but to grow generations of students who are willing and eager to replace that division with connection and communion. There has never been a greater urgency in contemporary history for that to happen. You guys are the ones who can do it, and right now is the time. Thank you guys so much.